Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Capital Preservation Board, Governor Herbert, and members of the legislature, we welcome you here on this very historic occasion as we celebrate the centennial 100 years of this incredible building. We thank all of you who are here. Uh, we would especially like to thank those who have worked so hard to make this evening possible, and we will recognize them uh, a little bit later on in the program. We recognize tonight on the stand with us, we have Governor Herbert and First Lady Jeanette Herbert. We're thankful for them uh, to be here tonight. We also have our Senate President and our Speaker of the House, and we will be hearing from them uh, a little bit later on in the program. We welcome former Governor Mike Levitt and Jackie Levitt here with us tonight. And I'm sure we have many other distinguished dignitaries of which I was not informed of and who will be completely offended uh, for not being recognized. So please feel welcome. We're grateful to have all of you here, and we're thankful for your, your presence. We will begin tonight with the presentation of the colors by the Utah Highway Patrol. Uh, following the presentation of the colors, we will have the national anthem sung by Viviana Wolfgram. Now, after the singing of the national anthem, the uh, Highway Patrol will post the colors, and then follow, following the posting of the colors, we will have an invocation by Pastor Francis Davis from the Calvary Baptist Church. Now. It is a possibility that Pastor Francis is not here yet. If he does not make it in time, uh, we have asked Pamela Atkinson if she would be willing to offer the invocation on behalf of Pastor Francis. Following, uh, following the invocation, we will be pleased to have an address by Governor Gary R. Herbert. He will be followed by Senate President Wayne Niederhauser. Following Senate Pres President Niederhauser, we will have a soprano solo from the University of Utah Opera Program. And I would ask you to note, if you look at your, uh, your, your program, you will see the actual program from the dedication 100 years ago. You will also note that the, uh, the performances that we will be hearing will be the same performances, albeit by different performers, that, we, uh, that they were pleased to have over 100 years ago. We will go to that point in the program, and then I will announce the the remainder at that time. Thank you.
I'm a little surprised to be up there. I'm so up here. I'm so sorry France Davis isn't here, but I'm um, up, do my best. Let us pray. Oh, most gracious God, how grateful we are to be here today to celebrate the most wonderful history of this great state we call Utah. We are so appreciative of all of those people who have gone before us, who have made it possible for us to have the lives that we now lead. We know that much of what has happened over the past hundred years has been with your help. And we acknowledge that we have one of the greatest places in the world to live right here. We acknowledge your goodness in all that we do and all that we say. And because we have been given so much, Lord, we ask that all of us in the state of Utah may be even more generous to those who do not have as much, who have little. We are so glad that we are a welcoming state to others who come who have had such terrible lives, Lord, and we ask that you will help us to help them to make new lives because this state really cares about people. We are grateful for our governor and the leaders, elected leaders of this state today, Lord, and we ask that all who lead may be given the courage and the resilience to continue to lead this state in the direction that it has been going, that we may achieve even more than what the people who have gone before us have done. And we say all of these things in very grateful thanks, Lord. Amen. Well, thank you, Pamela. Uh, you demonstrate the strength of Utah, which is found in the goodness of her people. And Pam was a great example of the goodness of our people here in Utah. Jeanette and I are honored to be with all of you here today and uh, our honored guests and people of Utah as we do celebrate uh, the 100 year anniversary of the dedication of this beautiful facility, this wonderful building here we call our capital. Um, it's actually 100 years tomorrow, the actual day of the dedication, and uh, it was. Uh, done with much fanfare, as you can probably appreciate at the time. And um, a lot of people showed up, several thousand people showed up for the dedication at the time. And according to Deseret News, they watched in breathless silence. It was an occasion that uh, warranted some pomp and circumstance uh, at the time. But what was said was remarkably kind of hype-free, a little different than some of the politics we see today. Uh, but it was also rather prophetic. Let me just read to you what Governor William Spry said when they laid the cornerstone on April 14, excuse me, April 4th of 2014. He said, for years, Utahns have looked forward to this day. They have looked forward to this day because it would signify that they were taking their places alongside their brothers of other states in the ownership of a great state house. And John Dern, who was a prominent businessman at the time uh, and a member of the Utah State Capitol Commission, said this, that this magnificent structure placed upon this commanding site with one of the world's most enchanting panorama, panoramas spread out before it will attract lovers of the beautiful from all parts of the globe. Let us not doubt that it will be a source of inspiration and pride to our own people, let us not doubt. That it is worthwhile sometimes to enrich our minds by contemplating artistic ideals, let us not doubt. And that Utah has a future great enough to justify us in building so nobly, not for the present merely, but for the future. Let no one, least of all, no loyal son or daughter of Utah, ever for one moment doubt. Uh, I revere those who had the vision and the fortitude to build this magnificent structure. Um, as John Dern predicted, that people would come from 
uh, all around the world lovers of the beautiful, and it's true. We have thousands, tens of thousands that come here every year to come and observe and look at and contemplate this beautiful, magnificent, ornate building. I think we can see that it justified its cost, the bargain basement price 100 years ago of $2.7 million. Um, it's not limited just to the aesthetics that we see here, though. I think our state capital has just as importantly has become a symbol of Utah and Utah's dream and aspirations. It symbolizes the pride that we have for the past and the optimism we share for Utah's future. A century ago, uh, the visionary leaders who built the capital laid a solid foundation to make Utah what it is today. Our charge today, as we gather 100 years later, is to build upon the foundation that they laid for us and to make Utah's future even brighter for our children, for our grandchildren, for those who come after. So this evening, my charge to all of us is ask you to join with me, Jeanette, our legislative leaders and others of this state in building upon the foundation laid by those who came before us a century ago. Let us renew our commitment of the principles of sound governance, hard work, civic involvement, compassionate service, and individual responsibility so that Utah will continue to be that shining example that this country needs in these difficult times and falls in the words of our state song, Utah, This is the Place, where it says, a great place to be, blessed from heaven abode, it's the land that we love, this is the place. May Utah ever be thus. May we have good people, may we be good people, that we might have the blessings of heaven, I pray, and hope that God's blessings will be upon you, upon this great nation at a difficult time. May God bless the great state of Utah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Herbert, and I'd like to express gratitude to the Capital Preservation Board for all they do for this great edifice that we have to have as our symbol of government in Utah. As Senate President, I get a chance to see a lot of capitals across the country, and there isn't any that are as grand as our capital here in, Utah, here in our state. This grand hallway down the middle, there's nothing like it in any capital um, across our country. And so we can be very proud and, and thankful that uh, a legislature a little over a decade ago took the time and, vi and had vision, set aside some money to renovate it and polish it and make it so it will be here for another hundred years. The Utah State Capitol has been called a temple of democracy. In my mind, it is also a temple of stone, a temple of light, and a temple of the people. First, as you can see, this is a temple of stone. The floor, walls, and columns you, uh, around us are Cherokee white marble from Georgia. The stone on the outside of the Capitol is from Little Cottonwood Canyon. The Senate chamber features honey onyx from Utah's West Desert, just past Tooele, and matched with stone from Afghanistan. The gold room and the house chamber are built from bird's eye marble from uh, bird's eye, Utah. Downstairs, you'll find limestone from Manti. The terrace features gray stone from China. The lions guarding the east and west entrances of the Capitol were crafted from revolutionary quarries Michelangelo used to shape his masterpieces. The beautiful stone of our capital is diverse and strong, common and precious. It originates from all parts of the world, both local and far away. And it is not rigid or fragile as some stone structures become. All of it is balanced atop base isolators that allow this building to gracefully sway and yet remain solid in an earthquake. In the same way, people here tonight hail from all parts of the state and even maybe from parts of the world. 
Our government is crafted from the best elements of many philosophies and traditions. We are inclusive and flexible, but well-built, principled, and strong. Our state budget is balanced. We pay forward by building the infrastructure of the future, and we maintain a healthy savings account. Through principled-centered leadership, we maintain an environment that encourages strong people, safe communities, and a prosperous economy. The Capitol is also a temple of light. Richard Kledding felt strongly about natural light, and so did David Hart and other framers of our Capitol. The skylights above us are the largest of any state capital. During the day, they flood this area with light. The auxiliary corridors then take that sunlight to the whole of the building in every direction. Both Senate and House chambers are filled with natural light. Light lifts our spirits. It invites us to think of higher things. It helps us to see. In the same way, an open and transparent system of government is healthy for all involved. Here at the Capitol, every official legislative action is live-streamed, tweeted, and archived. Every action, every committee meeting, every vote is available for every citizen to witness and to review. Citizens can engage in the process in person or through multiple websites, over two dozen social media channels. Each dollar spent by government is available on transparent.utah.gov, every single check that is written. All this illustrates one principle. All corridors of power require light. Finally, and most importantly, this capital is a temple of the people. The capital is an embodiment of the American Republic and the roles reserved to her citizens. It is an embodiment of our constitutional rights. It symbolizes the access you have to the governor, to the legislature, and to the courts. This building is dedicated to the reality that people own the government and not the other way around. Like this building, your government is just an extension of you, and you are absolutely responsible for what happens here. As you entered today, you might have noticed that the stone steps that lead up to the rotunda, up to the rotunda are worn thinner in places by citizen footsteps over the last hundred years. Those footprints engraved slowly over time are now a sacred symbol of the many people who have dedicated their time to shape our great state. I would like you, I would invite you to look past today, a hundred years from now. Is this building still standing? More importantly, does light still flow through it? Is government transparent? Is it open? Is it strong, smart, good, and accountable? The answer depends entirely on you, upon us, and it depends on the people you elect to send here to this beautiful building. Finally, let us recognize and give thanks to him who taught us his precepts and built this nation, who lovingly crafted the materials who, of which this capital is built and who gave life, liberty, to each of us and to our children. In the words of Psalms 119, we will walk at liberty, for we seek his precepts. May God bless America, may God bless this state, and may the next hundred years in this, in this building may be as magnificent as the past hundred years. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was, uh, that was Lisa Zimmerman accompanied by Jeffrey Price. And I think as you can see, this building, w the acoustics were designed for singing, not so much for speaking. So thank you so much for that, that incredible number. Uh, we will now be pleased to hear an address from the Speaker of the House, uh, Greg Hughes, followed by a poem recital, Utah, written and recited by Jeff Carson. Following Jeff, we will have another address by a Capital Preservation Board member, Representative Patrice Arendt. And following Patrice, we will have a tenor solo by Addison Marler, accompanied again by Jeffrey Price. And we will go to that point in the program. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for being here. It's a pretty fancy ordeal we have here, a lot of top hats, a lot of tuxedos, and then you look at me, the Speaker of the House. Well, how am I dressed? Well, I don't know what it was like 100 years ago, but I suspect that our House of Representatives had a bunch of ruffians in there, like the guys and the gals I'm looking at out here, my colleagues, uh, at this celebration here tonight. So I wanted to, uh, my period piece that I wanted to dress in kind of reflected what I call the arena, and that is the House of Representatives. What I also want to talk about tonight is what were, kind of, what were those issues? What was the arena and what were we going through here uh, in this very building as it was, the secret is that the legislature couldn't wait for this day on October 9th, 1916. They moved in in February of 1915, started working. So what was going on here in this building at the time of its uh, celebration and the time that this uh, ceremony took place? Well. We had, uh, this was at that time called the Age of Reform. And in that time of the Age of Reform between 1890 and World War I, 
there were basic reforms in the response to slums that had found their way into Utah communities. There was a concerted attempt, uh, concentrations of economic power, inequitable tax laws were being discussed, distribution of wealth, labor strife, anti-black prejudice, wasteful consumption of the nation's resources, and the biggest and most controversial issue of at the time was prohibition. Alcohol, alcohol reform. Does that sound familiar to any of my colleagues? So here we are, 100 years later. I will tell you that uh, we stare at issues of tax reform. We look at the homelessness issue that we have here and, and that we're all working as uh, stakeholders in. We're looking at the, sorry. We're looking at our justice reform that we have worked on. We have done something that uh, other states have not done yet, and uh, we lead uh, by example in our anti-discrimination LGBT issues and our religious liberty issues and bringing those together in compromise. Uh, these are issues that of our time and with the social strife and the conflicts, we're finding agreement. So this hill, this place, before there was a capital on it, was called Arsenal Hill. And I don't know if it was ironic or they thought it would be funny to put a, a legislative state capital at a place that otherwise held the, uh, the, bat, the, the explosives and the weapons of war and everything they needed to go to battle. But what they did is they moved all that out and they brought this building in here. And I will tell you that I think the battles, while different, kind of still continue, but they're battles of ideas. The battles of ideas have been going on here for a long time. I want to tell you that from this hill and from this state, I think Utah leads out across this country in issues like I just mentioned, anti-discrimination and religious liberty, a transportation infrastructure and a transportation initiative that states would dream to be able to A, plan and B, implement the way we are in the state of Utah. Our justice reform, opiate abuse is taking over and is becoming a true health crisis. Our, uh, our legislature has tackled uh, with leadership from both the House and Senate, but I have to, sorry, President, I have to point to my colleague, Representative Hutchings, his leadership in the House on justice reform and what that's doing to help people in, tra in their trajectory of their lives. From this hill and from this state, we lead this country with its strongest economy. We lead in a place where we continue to be a pioneer state, where people from all over the world flock here, come here. Our greatest challenge is to accommodate that kind of growth. This building was meant not for the people of the time, its size, its scope, what happens here, was not meant for 1916. They had a vision. They knew that there would be an, an increase of flocking to this state and a population growth, and they prepared for that. So lastly, let me just say this, and we say this in the House all the time, if it's easy, and it's impactful, someone else got to do it. It's already been done. All we have left are the impactful things that are the hard things to do. This building and its vision, this was a hard thing to do at the time. And I hope that all of us are proud of the traditions that we have carried on and that we tackle these hard issues and that we do the important things that aren't easy but require the kind of strength of will that this building has created a legacy for and that we have the honor to serve within and to see as part of our state, its government, and a symbol of its industry. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, let me say what an honor it is for me to be able to be involved in such a great event. When I got a phone call asking if I would write a poem about this building, I said, well, sure, I'd love to. When I ha hung up, I thought, I may be in trouble. How am I going to write a cowboy poem about a building? So I started thinking about the state capitol, and you can't really think about the capitol building without thinking about the state of Utah. And you can't really think about the state of Utah without thinking about those who made it happen, the first settlers here, the pioneers. So that's how this poem came about. The year of 1847, 
driven from their homes, a destitute band of refugees across the prairie roams. In search of a new beginning, as they marched across the sod, blazing trails and forging rivers, being led by the hand of God. To the valley of the mountains, a hard but steady pace, until the call was heard, we're here, this is the place. It's here we'll raise our families, it's here we'll call our home. No longer are we refugees, no longer shall we roam. Early the very next morning as the hard work began, busy planting crops, building homes, and clearing land. Industry became the motto, the symbol, the honey beehive, depicting thrift and perseverance, dedication, work, and drive. These once before refugees in a world so out of tilt had now found their place, and towns and cities were being built. Tradesmen came from near and far, possessing craft and skill, erecting granite masterpieces like this one here on the hill. Built by men of vision, a gift reserved for only some, to not only see a present need, but for that which is yet to come. For a hundred years, this lady has stood as a shining beacon on the hill, depicting and exemplifying the Utah values she tries to instill. And if it were somehow possible, or if we could just rewind the clock, or if some, by some magical power, these old walls could talk. She could tell you quite the story as she stood upon the hill and watched in awe and wonder as the valley began to fill. She could tell you about the Great Depression that hit the valley hard and the devastating effects it had that left so many scarred. Or she could tell you of an event that shook her to the core as she stood and watched families send their young men off to war. Or she could tell you about the happier times with celebrations and parades. This lady has seen a lot over the years, and as those years have become decades. She could tell you about the debates as bills were brought to the Senate floor. She could tell you about the ones that passed, and she could probably tell you a whole lot more. But truth is, she's just a building, nothing more than concrete and stone. But what it is that makes her great are the people that she's known. Those that have chosen to serve behind these granite walls, leaders past and present who's walked these marbled halls. Those that have served with honor and integrity on both sides of the race. And after 169 years, this is still the place. Thank you so much. First, I'd like to thank Allison Gamble and the entire staff of the Capital Preservation Board and all the incredible volunteers for not just tonight, but this entire week. Thank you. For those of you who have not been here this week, there have been tens of thousands of students and performances and all kinds of wonderful docents and just incredible activities every day and every night. And it's really been a, just a joy to be here. So how does Utah, the Utah of today compare to the Utah of 1916? Well, in 1916, people were thrilled that the University of Utah basketball team won their first national championship, and the football team beat USC. Sound familiar? In Ogden, they were trying to have a zoo. That never quite worked out. The newspaper I read was the Ogden Standard, and they called themselves the fearless, independent, progressive newspaper. My grandparents moved to Ogden in 1916. My grandfather was here to trade furs with the trappers. Fashion today, I think, fares a little better than it did 100 years ago. The Democrats, however, um, I'm not sure we do quite as well. Let me tell you about the 1916 election. Democrats won big. In fact, after that election, there were only five Republicans left in the entire legislature. Democrat 
William King, a relative of our state representative Brian King, won for the U.S. Senate, and both congressional seats were won by Democrats. And Utahns supported Democrat Woodrow Wilson for president. I think I need a time machine to send me back 100 years. <laughs> that year, we elected Simon Bangberger, our fourth governor. He was our first Democratic governor, our only Jewish governor, and an immigrant from Germany. He accomplished more than many governors combined. He established a, a commission to regulate securities years before the federal government recognized the need. He created the Public Service, excuse me, Utilities Commission to regulate the price of electricity and gas. And he banned gifts from utilities to companies to public officials. He created the State Health Department and instituted water conservation. And Bamberger, a teetotaler, signed the Prohibition Law. He also signed laws establishing workers' compensation and mandatory high school attendance. In 1916, Elizabeth Pugmire Hayward was one of the few women in the Utah House. That sounds familiar. She was also a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. In fact, a few years before, she was one of the first women in the country to be a delegate to a national party convention for a major party. She was truly an amazing person. She had nine children and served as president of the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers. And while she was in the Utah Senate, she introduced the bill to ratify the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, granting women the right to vote. Of course, Utah was way ahead of many states on that issue. Utahns are industrious, ingenious, and frugal. In 1916, no one exemplified those attributes better than William Horace Coulthart. He was a shrewd businessman, and he wanted to build a bank in Vernal, but he didn't want to pay for the cost of shipping the bricks through the railroad from Salt Lake City to Vernal. So he utilized the Postal Service's 50-pound limit for packages and mailed 38 tons of bricks. The regulations changed after the postal authorities complained, but by then, the bricks were already in Vernal. <laughs> and you know, that building is still in use today as a bank. Zions, Zions Bank in, in Vernal. Today's Utahns continue that spirit of ingenuity. A hundred years later, we still find creative ways to solve problems. We overcome whatever challenges we face, and we build for the sake of greater good. Thank you. Per sogni e per chi mere, e 
Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you've enjoyed this program thus far. As I had an opportunity to reflect, we were driving here to the Capitol. Um, for me personally, this is an important day. It was three years ago in that room right there this day that um, Governor Herbert announced that he had a new lieutenant governor. And my wife and I and our family sat terrified on those chairs wondering what the coming days and months and years would mean. Uh, I can tell you that over these past three years, not a day goes by that I come to this building that, uh, that I don't pinch myself and, and thank the God in heaven for the opportunity that I have to come to this beautiful edifice and serve the people of this great state. As, as we listen to the words of that incredible poem, I was especially touched by the ending, and it is so true. This building is great because her people are good. And I know that we live in a world right now, in a country right now, whose eyes are turning to us more often and wondering what is so great about the state of Utah. I never, I never pass a chance to remind people that we lead the nation when it comes to volunteerism and charitable giving. I believe it is those two statistics that make the state of Utah great first and foremost and forever. And I hope it's something that we will never forget, that 100 years from now, uh, those that come next will be able to stand in this great edifice and give thanks for the sacrifices of the people that were here 100 years before. I like to think that those that were here 100 years ago would be very pleased if they could see where we were as a state today. And I hope that that will continue. Now, I want to remind you of the, uh, the events that are to follow this evening. We hope you will stay around. Uh, immediately following our benediction, we invite you to a reception in the Hall of Governors, which is immediately below us. So just go down either set of stairs, elevators on each side, and find your way to the Hall of Governors where there will be, uh, there will be hors d'oeuvres and an opportunity to, uh, to mix and mingle and, uh, and chat with everyone that is here tonight. Following the reception, that will go for approximately 30 minutes. Uh, we will return, I believe here, is that correct, Allison? We'll return here to the rotunda where we will be pleased to have a dance exhibition from BYU's famous ballroom dance company. We're very much looking forward to that. Following that exhibition, at 8 o'clock, we will have public dancing. 
Um, I'm assuming that that won't be quite as great as the ballroom dancers, but some of us will try anyway. Uh, we hope you enjoy that. The public dancing will go for approximately one hour, and at, and at 9 o'clock, no festivity uh, would be complete without fireworks. So at 9 o'clock, we will exit the building and uh, enjoy some fireworks. Now, before we, uh, before we close, there are some people that we need to thank. Uh, I would like to, th to personally thank uh, all who have contributed tonight, uh, especially uh, those members who serve in the office of the governor, the office of the lieutenant governor, the Utah State Senate, and the state of Utah House of Representatives. All of their staff have been so helpful in putting this together and making it work. We would also like to, uh, to uh, give a special thanks to the sponsors who helped to make this night and the events of this week possible, Zions Bank. Jacobson Construction, Smith's Food and Drug Stores, Sweet Candy Company, Ron Fox, Representative Steve Elison, Lantis Fireworks, Robin Haney, Conservator, MJSA Architects, Rivalry Engineers and Associates, and Abstract Masonry Restoration. Thank you. Let's give them all a round of applause if you would. Now, there are some other people who have worked very diligently to help make this night happen as well. I would like to personally thank the uh, Capital Preservation Board members if they would please stand um, as I read your name. I am honored to serve as the uh, co-chair of that group, my fellow co-chair, Representative Brad D., Senator uh, Stuart Adams, Senator Peter Knutson, Senator Jean Davis, Representative Keith Grover, Representative Patrice Arendt, Chief Justice Matthew Durant, Attorney General Sean Reyes, State Treasurer David Damption, and State Historic Preservation Officer Brad Westwood. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. We would like to thank our Capitol docents and volunteers. For those of you who are not aware, we have had tens of thousands of students here this week. Now, if you've never been in the Capitol when thousands of students are here, you should try it sometime. Uh, it's quite an experience and has been an incredible week. So we would like to thank our docents and volunteers who made that happen. Um, at this time, I would also like to, to uh, thank our Capitol Preservation Board staff. And uh, Allison, would you please come up here uh, for just a second? As our legislature knows, uh, in the state of Utah, we are famous for doing more with less. And I can tell you that no one does more with less than Allison and her team. Uh, you, have, you can't even begin to imagine the sheer number of events that take place here on a daily basis. And with a very small, a very robust, and a very efficient staff, uh, they deal with all of those, those events, all of those issues. They go off without a hitch, and they make everyone feel welcome here in the People's House. Allison is the leader of that team. I would like to ask her other team members to stand as well as we honor her and thank her and her team as well. I do have one final announcement. Um, upon, upon closing, upon uh, the, the end of the, uh, the benediction, if we could ask everyone here to please help us put away the chairs. That is truly the Utah way. <laughs> it's something we do extremely well here, better than any other state. And with your help, we can knock that out very quickly. Uh, now, there is some instruction, though, that goes, uh, 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 that goes with that. These chairs in the first, perhaps, 10 rows with the gold backing, we would ask you to place those around the rotunda so people have a place to sit. Those who aren't dancers will have an opportunity to sit. The folding chairs from the middle back, uh, those will be folded up and placed on racks, and we will have people to help you do that. So if you could help us with that, we will move quickly and then move down to the, uh, to the Hall of Governors. Now, thank you again for attending tonight. We hope you have enjoyed this entire program. We will now have a benediction from Rabbi Ilana Schwartzman, the Congregation of Kolomi.
Eloheinu v'elohei avoteinu, our God and God of our ancestors, as you blessed them with foresight, forbearance, to build this wonderful structure, to prepare for the generations to come, may you also bless us with foresight and endurance, helping us to keep in mind those generations that will continue to follow. May our state ever be a beacon of hope, of liberty and justice. May we continue to be blessed. Bivracha shalom ufarnasa with blessing, peace, and prosperity. May it be God's will. Amen.